You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change Podcast by Nori, the world's first carbon removal marketplace. Here are your hosts, Ross Kenyon and Christoph Jospe. Hello, welcome to the Reversing Climate Change Podcast with Nori. I'm Ross Kenyon. I'm here with Christoph Jospe. We're up in Vancouver, Canada, which is great. We always like coming up here. We eat a lot of sushi. It's not that different from Seattle, I feel like, in terms of weather, but it was very foggy today. More fog than I've probably seen. (laughs) What would you say? Is that normal for Seattle? I'm not up there yet, really. It seems foggier than Seattle. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. We had a nice lunch and supposedly could have seen across the water there the downtown, but we didn't. Yeah, I could see like 100 feet out onto the water. I couldn't see anything else really at all. But we're here with Alden Donnelly, and she is our chief of carbon economics. Is that the correct term we're, we've landed on? It is not producer Paul scolding me across. What <laughs> She's actually a director of Carbon Economics, and I am very jazzed for this podcast. I know that we're going to go in a lot of different places. I think it's nice to maybe kick it off of how we got in contact with you in the first place. So, Alden. It's one of those funny social media success stories. I tend to tweet quite dense, fact-filled tweet streams, and Paul Knopf's from the Netherlands responded to one of my tweets one day and just said that, They're trying to design a different carbon offset system in the Netherlands. And we got into an exchange. We moved off tweet to direct mail and then email and then had telephone conversation. And I've never met face to face, but we've had, I think, a very constructive interaction that both of us very much appreciated. So by the time he learned what you were trying to do, he introduced me or you to me and me to you. And that's so it came right off Twitter. Well, and then you guys also met on Twitter, Paul, Gamble, and and Christoph, right? Yeah, we have a lot to thank Twitter for, really. (laughs) (laughs) That's the only time Twitter has ever been professionally useful for me. Oh, is it? Yeah. I just knew Paul. I just knew you from Meet Space, so they get no credit for that one. No, that was all us. No. So I remember this was back in September when Paul and I had a very long phone call with Alden, and it blew our mind on many, many levels, both because of your background and also what you're saying. Let's start with the background. It's awesome that you're part of Nori, but how did you get to being where you are here, sitting in your living room with this podcast? (laughs) I don't know. It's a crazy tale. A number of things led to me bringing together a consortium of ultimately 14 of Canada's 20 largest emitters. And we decided the exercise we had come together to do was to pretend that existing carbon markets, regulated carbon markets worked, and to seek emission reduction in those days and emission removal, potential project directors to enter into contracts with them where we would have long-term purchase agreements, 12 to 15 year terms, where we would purchase then what we called offset credits. The objective was not to become like big players in the nascent market, but the objective that we all signed on to was we'd never had any cap and trade in Canada, unlike the US. And so the objective was to actually have the corporations and my positions on cap and trade be formed by actual real practical experience instead of just sort of theory and going to conferences and hearing stuff. And we're going to have to inquire here, what is cap and trade in the the broadest, most layperson sense? It's quota-based supply management. So, What is quota-based supply management? Government <laughs> picks a sector and creates a production or supply quota limit and then decides who the winners and losers are. So the government will say we can produce like a set amount of CO2 and then people will have allocations and then they'll they'll jockey and sell them to people who need it more than they do. That's right. That's right. That exists for other things too. Like we were talking about the acid rain uh, yeah. markets of that. Yeah. But I would want to go to back to first principles. What I find pretty interesting is almost every leading academic in the world would tell you categorically that quota-based supply management when used to manage dairy or chicken or other agriculture markets, is highly inefficient. And the same economists who advocate for cap and trade are saying quota-based supply management is really efficient if you're using it to manage energy and building product markets. People do this for dairy? Like you would have... We have supply management in Canada for dairy, chickens, and other ag projects. Like uh, you can, we're going to produce like this amount of chickens and people... Every, every year, the federal government decides what the maximum amount of dairy products and chickens are that should be produced to attain a certain minimum price 
for the Canadian producers. They convert that into a quota supply, which is auctioned now to all of the producers. And you can't supply those products in Canada unless you've got quota. So I hate that, but I think cap and trade is... Uh, exactly the same. Is it, is, is it, it's just as bad. Uh, oh, but by the way, it only <laughs> took me 20 years to figure that out. Uh, okay. So cap and trade is to energy and building products, iron, steel, aluminum, cement, as quota-based supply management is to, in Canada, milk, butter, fat, and cheese. And it's bizarre that it took me 20 years to figure it out, but it's more bizarre that most of the leading economists in Canada and the U.S. haven't yet figured that out. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess, how did you get to this point, too? I know you have some things that you're able to name drop quite successfully, Mm -hmm. like being at Kyoto, right? I I wasn't at Kyoto, but I was at other other cops. But Kyoto was a... You were in Osaka, you were in Tokyo, you were in (laughs) (laughs) suburbs. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, COP? Conference of the Parties. So there's something called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is an underlying international treaty. And at Kyoto in 1997, the parties to what we call the UNFCCC agreed to moving forward to what is a kind of a global cap and trade, a version of global cap and trade to manage at the time developed nation primarily carbon emissions. And after all of the meetings of the nations that agreed to embrace targets in Japan, in Kyoto in 1997, those meetings are called conferences of the parties. So it's a subset of the original treaty group, which we call COPs. And we're on like COP, I don't know, 20. Alden, I'd like to take it back a little bit. So you're an economist Mm -hmm. and you found yourself in a very interesting position in 1997, but how did you get there? And what sort of principles did you bring that were unique to the carbon offset accounting issues that weren't in the other markets? Well, to start and up until that time, my focus for years had been I always working at that intersection between innovation, new technology and big companies struggling with the impacts of innovation on their standard business or adoption. So without reference to necessarily to pollution or carbon, my chosen profession was working with either innovators trying to break into new markets or traditional companies trying to bring innovation and deal with disruption due to new technologies. And without sort of thinking of it consciously, by the mid-80s, I was mostly working in the environment space. And by the early 90s, I rightly or wrongly formed the opinion that if we were to be operating efficiently, we'd focus on greenhouse gas emissions. Generally, at the time, the most cost-effective methods for reducing the acid rain precursors and some other key pollutants we were focused on, if you ranked the, say, the five most cost-effective methods for reducing those pollutants, typically number one, two, and three, increase greenhouse gas emissions. But if you turned your focus to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, eight times out of 10, you're also reducing other pollutants. So I got it in my head that if we could move people's focus to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and then say, okay, when it comes to strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, let's just not proceed with those limited 20% of strategies that increase criteria pollutants. And wouldn't it be much more efficient? This is where I started. Wouldn't it be much more efficient to just have that focus on greenhouse gases and then be able to dump all of the other criteria pollutant regulations out of the policy mix? Because we are, we're efficiently focusing on the one factor with a qualifier. So that's sort of got me focused on greenhouse gases to start. When is this going on? 1994, 1993, around there. Okay. And so you're focused on greenhouse gases professionally, and then somehow this starts leading to the Kyoto Protocol that is being generated? No, we were working really independent of the Kyoto Protocol. So in 1995, the truth is, as a consultant, I was doing similar work for a number of competing energy companies, mostly, but not only utilities. So after a while, I decided that was stupid. So I said to everybody, why don't you just all come together and I work for all of you together and not just do the same work and create a process where you're learning from each other, not just from me. And that became what we called the Greenhouse Emissions Management Consortium, 
which we thought was going to be a learning by doing exercise, which I thought would have an operating life of about two or three years, and it ran for 12 years. And what became of that, and, and what did you learn by doing there? We decided the way to learn about how carbon markets were likely to work was, again, sort of all go to work every day and pretend we now had a regulated obligation to reduce emissions, but we had no constraints on how we did it and go out and finance projects and have the exercise of actually doing it and form our opinions so that we actually had experience. We had not planned on being a particularly large player in the nascent carbon markets, but by 2002, I'm told by many others that I was acting on their behalf, the largest private sector buyer of carbon credits in the world at the time. When we were doing that, the companies were learning a lot and it was informing their policies. My objective wasn't to get all of the companies to come down and say, yes, cap and trade is it, but have each of the companies have the experience when you combine it with their business plan and their reality, inform their policies, get them ahead of the curve. When we put our early contracts together in that experiment, we, in those contracts, adopted a bunch of very common, normal business principles, which is, for example, an offset credit was supposed to represent a reduction in a physical inventory. So Yeah, duh. <laughs> so in our contracts, before you could sell me a credit, you had to produce your physical inventory and you had to agree to publish it. And if you sold me real interest in a minus one, you had to add a balancing plus one to your inventory so that when we were doing trades in the marketplace, everything was properly accounted for, everything added up. And that's called double blind accounting. Or right? double entry bookkeeping double sometimes. Entry bookkeeping. Okay. Which didn't happen in the to my housing market either, no, right? To my shock and surprise, when governments and other players sort of jumped in to take over the carbon market, they decided no double entry bookkeeping. So even if every other discipline in a traditional kind of market was applied, which is not the case, by definition, that meant at a minimum, every offset credit out there was being credited twice everywhere. And well, that's still true today in voluntary and compliance markets. And I was sitting there with this big portfolio working on behalf of my investors, which was, again, primary for learning, but I didn't want them to lose money. And I realized I had no capacity to get the market to see the difference between what I called, you know, our real Gucci bags versus the, the uh, knockoff Gucci bags that were the markets that were being built by the establishment. So why do they not want to be able to keep track of this? Why would they want this double counting to occur? To tell you the truth, I don't think it was a case of want or not want. I think ways of doing things just sort of took off and we didn't have that sort of sit down and say, well, wait a second, we, we are technically creating a derivative instrument, a certificate that represents a change in a physical inventory. And we've let this take off and there's no connection between the certificate and physical inventories. It never occurred to me that we would do that. This seems like a pretty big deal and kind of an egregious error on the part of carbon markets. Except it, when I started to look, I thought, where is this coming from? I thought it was so unusual. And of course, then if you looked, you saw that's exactly what was happening in the secondary mortgage market. So it was actually standard practice in certain financial markets. I just was unfamiliar with those markets or the fact of those standard practices at the time. Yeah. And then- how did that play out in things like the Chicago Climate Exchange? Well, as you know, the Chicago Climate Exchange didn't survive. And in fact, when I looked back in history, there are a lot of cap and trade type, we didn't call them cap and trade, but cap and trade type markets that regulators, particularly in the US, but not only in the US, had set up over the years since the 1960s. Pretty much every such market, there's one exception, crashed and burned under the weight of surplus excess compliance certificates in anywhere from three to, I often say three to five years, maybe to be fair, I should say three to seven years. And the Chicago Climate Exchange died in right on schedule. So there was just too much supply of these credits? Al always, every time. I feel like, Nori, we're, we're kind of worried about the opposite problem of just making sure that the demand is able to be met. I could be wrong. You know, this is just twenty twenty hindsight. But I think if we had been more successful at building a market where there was that contractual connection between the tradable instrument, derivative, and the physical inventory it purports to represent, I think we'd be a lot farther along in terms of real carbon markets and greenhouse gas reductions today than, than we are. There was a lot of money ready, ready to play. 
I think there is today too, but it's different money and it's for different reasons. But if you again look at the Chicago Climate Exchange, which claims some successes, and I won't, you know, say there weren't some. Just go look at who the registered members of the Chicago Climate Exchange were, and there was, and it's a long list. Does it include more than two of the twenty largest utilities in the United States, or any two of the twenty or thirty largest emitters in Canada? No. In my view, those guys were willing to play, but they didn't know what maybe right should look like. But they knew that wasn't it, and we slowed things down. We slowed things down a lot at that time. So we're talking about markets. Some of the markets crashing, market design. What are the elements of a good market, and what are the elements of a market that's destined to crash? Well, in a good market, if your inventory is ten and my inventory is ten, and I pay you to reduce by two, and you sell real interest in the minus two to me before we did the deal, if we looked at your sustainable development report or annual report before we did the transaction, yours said ten, mine said ten, they added up to twenty. And in a good market, after we do the transaction, your report says eight. Your, your report. I'm twelve, and okay. you're eight. <laughs> well, your report says I've paid you to go down to eight. Oh right, okay, so I am eight. You are eight, and I'm ten. But I've bought minus two from you, so when the minus two is transferred to me, you go to plus two because after we've done the deal, the total between us is eighteen. It is down two in every carbon market in the world right now, including California's. If that allowance or credit Crosses a border, you report eight and I report eight. So the total physical total is eighteen, and we're reporting sixteen. Now you don't do that for very long over very many balance sheets in combination before the certificate you've got floating around is just in massive surplus. Right, the market has to crash. It isn't about market manipulation or anything like that. You're just always creating at least two certificates for every minus one, and you can't do that for very long before you got to start over. So accounting seems like a pretty big part of this. Then, yeah, and this is what gets you excited about blockchain technology. Yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be easier to start over with blockchain, and I, I'm really excited about that. What else do you think makes a good market in carbon? Good market in carbon. I, you know, still open to opportunities to trade in certificates that represent real emission reductions, but it's now 2017. I started having these discussions in. 1993, 94. Too much time has passed. We can't achieve the environmental objectives that we are talking about through reduced energy use and reduced fossil fuel use. And I don't think it's a attitude problem. I just think it's physically impossible to make the numbers work. So the only viable path forward is to focus on removing carbon from the atmosphere, which. Should be exciting to people because certainly not in every case, but in many cases, you know, farmers can remove carbon from the atmosphere, increase the amount of carbon stored in their soil while they increase their food production and their profitability. There are very significant opportunities to really focus on carbon removal to get back on track towards our twenty thirty twenty fifty goals in a way that actually isn't asking people to give up stuff is actually. Potentially increasing the profitability of food producers and food supply, and that's just one example. There are many, so I, I'm pretty excited about just focusing on that side, that part of the opportunity. It seems so easy from a sales perspective too, because we typically don't think that leaning on people's altruism is the easiest way to motivate people relative to if you can do the right thing for the planet and make money. Seems like you get a lot more buy-in than the resistance that we see now across、uh, environmental discussions as a whole. And you also just said something really important. As I said, there were many things that surprised me when the government and voluntary markets started to emerge. All of those markets today have something for the farmer, for the offset producer, the carbon offset producer. Something called an additionality test. Well, what's an additionality test? To get the right to list your carbon credits. On both these compliance and voluntary exchanges, you first have to satisfy the market administrator that you wouldn't make a profit or a reasonable return on your project without the revenue from the carbon credit sales. What? What's the motivation there? It seems very odd. You'll have to ask them.、It's、I don't get it. I mean, <laughs> don't you want removing carbon from the atmosphere, or reducing emissions to be highly profitable? Don't you want the guys who figured out how to make money on this to 
to go first That's and show icky. the way. No, no, it's the environment. Yeah, yeah. Everything's got to feel good and be charitable, right? I know. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I still steal your line. Was that you being sarcastic, Ross? Yeah. I couldn't t- <laughs> no, I just I think people get kind of uh, squeamish about it, but I, I like that if you can if you can satisfy both of those things, I feel like everyone wins and we should be happy. If you're saying to that portion of the market, you can only play as long as you prove to me that every project you're bringing to the market is seriously uneconomic. Mm-hmm without the carbon revenues, then you're not building anything that represents a sustainable or rational new economy. If it doesn't make money or at least break even, it's definitely not sustainable. And you want them to be incentive to figure out more ways to make more money as opposed to having to come to approval bodies and verifiers and prove that they would lose their shirts if they kept doing this. Again, back when I was doing our first contracts, I thought I never anticipated we would be doing stuff like that. That just sounds so weird. So maybe we should just come up with some words and say them now that we don't use them at Nori, like additionality seems like Mm -hmm. a good one. Instead, we've got a baseline. That's right. And then we've got the activities after your baseline that are removing carbon. And those are the things that we count. Well, and for example, in one of the projects I did before any of this world that I didn't anticipate appeared, when we were using carbon credit purchase to incent building owners to invest in energy efficiency in the buildings. It's not like we paid them to do what they were already doing, but it was pretty clear in the market I was looking at that under normal circumstances, building operators in aggregate were generally increasing their energy efficiency over the whole population at a rate of 2% per annum. Wasn't that hard to say, okay, baseline is you improve your efficiency 2% per annum, I pay you for doing better than that. That sounds arbitrary, but it's still, again, leaves it to the market to get creative and say, hey, let's figure out a way to make money on this. And let's get people chasing us making money on this. Well, I'm still getting incremental gains in aggregate for the economy in terms of emission reductions. And I would argue both voluntary market and compliance market, I don't see much difference. Sort of bureaucracies came into play. You know, it just got weird. (laughs) (laughs) So can you talk a little bit about what, what is a voluntary market? What is a compliance market? There are a number of markets where companies with no obligation to reduce or offset their emissions step in as buyers and proponents of projects can reduce emissions, register and list their reduction achievements for sale to those companies. I think probably most familiar to sort of normal people who aren't nerds like us totally focused on this is when you... Speak for yourself. uh, (laughs) Don't don't love me in there is when you offer the opportunity to offset your emissions when you get on an airplane. That's a voluntary market. You don't have to do it. And and in most of those voluntary markets, as I said, it's not like the market administrators are irresponsible. They're actually employing procedures and principles that we see in compliance market. Now, what's a compliance market? The European carbon market, the California cap and trade market, are where there are a number of companies that have an obligation in theory to reduce their emissions or buy credits from other companies. And the other companies go through an approval process to list carbon credits for sale in that context. And in both that voluntary and compliance context, you've got this additionality test, which says you basically can only list your project if you can prove to us it's not economic. <laughs> Just again. So if you were to jump into one of these markets and you're you're a buyer, you're saying that there's a disconnect between the inventory and the certificate? That- yeah, the certificate purports to represent a change in the inventory, but there's no contractual link. So if I bought a credit in a voluntary market of California, okay. well, how exactly does that work? If, for example, someone plants trees in California and it's a forestry project and they're legitimately sequestering more carbon in the soil and in the trees, you know, there's a real tradable credit there. If in the California market, that credit gets sold to an emitter in Ontario, the emitter in Ontario and the Ontario government, again, take their actual inventory and then do minus one because they imported that credit. California doesn't add plus one to its inventory. So the credit may conceptually have some link to the inventory, but as soon as you start trading it, it doesn't anymore. So, you know, when a... The double entry bookkeeping is out the door. Out the door. So what's the result of that? The result of that is that those compliance certificates, whether you call them allowances or offsets, on the face of them, say one ton CO2E, 
but their underlying value can be much less than one ton CO2e. And yeah. so you've got your trading certificates that suggest a market price for carbon of 15 bucks. When if you actually look at what people are paying for their certificate and what its real underlying value is, they might be actually paying the equivalent of 30, 60, 90 bucks a ton. But they think the market's only willing to pay 15 bucks for a ton of carbon. It's because the instrument doesn't reflect one ton. It's just the market mechanics are not really in place. Yeah, so yeah, well. yeah. And again, you know, who'd have thunk if you if you're Boeing and you make planes and you pre-sale two planes to Air Canada or Southwestern, your inventory shows those two planes are in your inventory, but it also shows they're spoken for. We know how to do this right. <laughs> this is pretty like old fashioned. We know how to do this right. We just aren't. I think uh, double entry bookkeeping was invented by the Venetian traders like 600 years ago, something like that. Was looking at me. I know it's been around for a couple hundred years at least. Yeah. So when we did say we did a lot of different deals, when we did a deal where we paid a natural gas processor in Texas to capture their flue gas and inject the CO2 into the ground, our contract stipulated that when they go to report their emissions, I've bought the, the real interest in the, in the reduction, right? So our contract stipulated that when they go to report their emissions voluntarily in their sustainable development report, or even for regulatory compliance under EPA rules, which didn't exist at the time, but we anticipated would come at some point in time, they have to add to that inventory report all the reductions that they've sold to me. We didn't have any problem putting deals in place with those kinds of contractual requirements because that was rational. But then all this irrational behavior. Real-time fact check. Double entry bookkeeping has been around since the 13th century. Yeah. Oh, even older. Wow. Was it Venetians? <laughs> well, the Venetians were around in the 13th century too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so again, never occurred to us that there would ever be carbon markets that didn't have those kinds of provisions in the trading structure. Then all of a sudden there were everywhere worldwide in the system sponsored by the UN, in the system launched by the European Union in California. I want to talk about the Vancouver Stock Exchange. So <laughs> at some point, you, you got involved with them, yes? I was a public governor, so there was, for a, a couple of years, the Vancouver Stock Exchange had governors who were like a board of directors, and all of the brokerages that were essentially owners of the exchange had a person on the board, and then there were eight public governors. So we were outside and not part of the brokerage community. And the stock exchange had that governance model for a long, long, long time. What were you doing there exactly? I was brought in by some executives and brokerages who actually at the time, this was late 90s, that my experience in carbon markets would be beneficial to them because maybe the exchange should set up to be also trading carbon instruments. But I was a public governor and I had a lot of other due diligence sort of obligations. Short version of a long story is it, it was an interesting experience and the Vancouver Stock Exchange ceased to operate about three years after I served on the Board of Governors. I don't want to impugn either organization, but there are parallels. I know mm -hmm. we've talked in the Vancouver Stock Exchange is noted for penny stocks that are involved in mining oftentimes. And then there was often like a lot of market manipulation that would happen and, and crash it once in a while. Yeah, but it's a cautionary tale that we should all think about. I mean, the Vancouver Stock Exchange was originally founded in 1903. And from 1903 to, I don't know what would be the right date, but think maybe early 70s. If you were a mining company, you couldn't sell shares on a legitimate stock exchange. Most of the very significant mining companies that we think of today got their first round of funding on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, regardless where we think they're located. So that Wild West venture market that it was, was really important for a really, really long time. But when it was time to evolve to stay really important, that proved too hard to do. I guess you could use either example, either in the Vancouver Stock Exchange or in carbon markets. How do they do pump and dumps or how do operators do things that may not be in compliance or may not be in the interest of the organization that they're using their underlying commodity? I'm sorry, Ross, could you define pump and dump, please? <laughs> I mean, I think Alden actually is the expert here. Well, what would you say it is? Well, and That's called punting, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it as if it were trading shares. Okay. I own a bunch of shares and 
you and I enter an agreement where in the agreement it says that I'm going to sell 10,000 shares to you for a dollar a share. But the contract also stipulates that you are going to deliver 10,000 shares back to me for a dollar 50 cents a share on or before March 31st. Now, if one small player or only one set of two kind of small players do that, we, for a short term, create the illusion of an increase in demand and a significant future price. That's the pump. That's right. the pump. And if you get a lot of players involved or a small number of large players, you pump and pump and pump. And then when you're ready, you do what they call a sell short, which is you artificially manufacture the timing of an apparent reduction in demand, which results in a reduction in price. And when you sell short, you sell your shares to third parties. You commit to sell today at today's price but not to deliver till, say, next week, at which point in time, in theory, because you've manufactured the withdrawal of demand, you're pretty sure you can pick up the shares you've got to deliver in this sale for a significantly less cost than the market price the day you entered into the agreement. So typically in that kind of situation, it's what we call the, the innocent or the not inside investors that, that end up losing value. Yeah, we see this in cryptocurrency a fair amount too. If you're on one of the, the big exchanges, you'll see the troll box, which is the little chat window. Yeah. And people will be like, Xcoin or what? Xcoin might even be a thing. So I probably shouldn't well, use that. Another, another place you'll see an extreme amount of pump and dump was the US acid rain SO2 market. Oh, uh, that's interesting too. Because it's fully unregulated and nobody was breaking any laws doing that. I don't think anything in cryptocurrency like that is against the lobby. Yeah, people will oftentimes do that, or you'll have what are called whales, which are very big holders of a certain thing. Yeah. They'll start buying up, and then by the time the lowly people hear about it, it's, of course, already gone up 300%, right. and then they're buying it. And then, of course, everyone else is selling out of the market, and it crashes. And sorry to that little guy who got FOMO, the yeah. fear of missing out. Cryptocurrency markets don't have to be regulated to contain that activity. I don't think you'll ever eliminate that activity, but to contain that activity to a level that it's not destroying the market. We can structure the Nori cryptocurrency market in a responsible way, but be real clear that that's what we're trying to do. And pump and dump will never, ever disappear. It just seems like psychology. People see something that's rising right. and they, they that, go for that's it. That's right. So just the question is, how do you build your market so it's not creating that potential for big swings and big volatility. I think we can do that. You know, we just have to be aware and do it. I think some of the ways that we're combating that with the Nori marketplace is that one Nori ton token purchases one ton removed, one carbon removal credit. Yeah. And that, that rate of exchange is always fixed. That, and yeah. as soon as the carbon removal credit is sold to a buyer, it's retired and can no longer be sold. So I think we're going to be doing transactions one way. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to be doing something really special. Again, you're not going to completely eliminate the activity, but as long as that link between the token and the underlying physical commodity that we're creating, which is a commodity and under and physical because it is going to be contractually linked to an inventory, unlike the regulated carbon markets. Unlike cryptocurrency too, where the underlying commodity is just unreasonable hope of like a hundred x return <laughs> in a week. You know, like. <laughs> I would never call hope unreasonable. <laughs> oh, it's so optimistic. Oh, that's why you're here. Yeah, but again, I think our design has a strong enough link between the, the token and the underlying commodity. And what we are creating is a commodity as opposed to a theoretical concept that will be okay in that regard. But be real clear, it's not just venture stock markets. That have, as I said, I've never seen a market as dominated by pump and dump as the SO2 allowance market was before it crashed after seven years because all those markets crash in seven years or less. Hmm. And when you talk about commodities too, I'm, I got my series three recently, so I'm, I've been very interested in reading about this. And you think uh, a derivatives market for Noritan could be a very useful thing for people to plan around the dynamic nature of prices inside of a uh, carbon removal credits? Yeah. Again, as long as we have the, the discipline we're talking about commodities, but the example that comes to mind is the S&P index future. We should define this too, yeah, yeah. Future, futures and options, yeah, and even yeah. just what, what is a derivative uh, overall? A derivative is a piece of paper that 
can represent a bunch of things. When you buy that piece of paper, you're saying, I'm betting that the price or this index will be a buck fifty in 15 days. You can only sell that bet if somebody else is betting. It won't be a buck fifty. But those bets are tracked to actual real tradable commodities and securities and the trail, the accounting trail to those real physicals is very clear. Yeah, it's derivative in the sense that it isn't the underlying asset itself. It's, it's derived like a- from it. There's still a very, very tight accounting contractual link. There are other derivatives where they aren't just like I complained about a lot of the existing like- carbon markets. Mm-hmm where you've got certificates to represent a one-ton change in an inventory, but the accounting isn't stringent. Their underlying value isn't one ton. You can make a derivatives market where there isn't that strong connection, and you can make a derivatives market where there is that strong connection. When there isn't, it's a market that usually turns into a bubble and crashes. I don't hear anybody saying they're worried the S&P index futures market is going to crash. Yeah, There's a strong... I call it physical, but it's not physical. There was a strong contractual ledger link. So we can create a carbon market that looks more like an S&P index future than a secondary mortgage derivative, which failed to meet that stringency test. Yeah, let me paint a scenario here that I imagine a derivatives market for Noritan could be useful. So if you're a big institutional buyer of Noritan and you have committed through your corporate social responsibility statement that you are going to remove a thousand tons of carbon and the market right now is $30 per nori ton, you're essentially hoping that it doesn't go down from there, right? Because then you could have bought it a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. You could short in the futures market the nori ton. And then if it did go down, your average price between what you bought at and then what it is now would average out a little bit. So you'd be able yeah. to go back to the other VPs or your colleagues and would look like less of, of a fool potentially, or <laughs> well, like you but, got less of a good deal than you could have. But another, and again, uh, if we had securities and exchange officials, uh, people define derivatives different ways depending on where they come from. You know, and I'm using derivative like in the true technical sense of the word, we're trading a certificate that is derived from an underlying transaction. I mean, commodity like, or securities was like trade. the example where you're like short futures for Noritan. Is that not an example of what you're? Referring no, it to? is. Oh, but okay. I'm saying that I also include in my definition of derivatives, which some finance officials would not agree with, an options. If you're that company, mm-hmm. you could pay, you know, a consideration to buy an option to buy Noritans in the future at forty dollars. That doesn't mean you're obliged to buy those Noritans. So when the time comes, you might give up the consideration you paid for the option because Noritans might be trading for 25 and you'll just go to the market and pay for 25. So when you can introduce options, which are another form of derivative into the trading spectrum, into the buying and selling spectrum, a company can say, you know, I really, really, really know I want to offset my emissions. I really know this is the way I want to do it. But I also really know that if the cost of doing that exceeds 50 bucks a ton, I've got other plans. And so you allow them to use that instrument to hedge. Yeah, the way that I've always put it is that commodities or equities markets are about the allocation or distribution of ownership. And then derivatives markets are about the allocation or distribution of risk. That's essentially- I think that's a really good way to put it. I think it's a really good way to put it. But if we, again, going back to the pump and dump and how things can go sideways, to have a really useful, lasting living derivatives opportunity, we have to have that accounting discipline that is missing, which we can build in. It's easier to do with blockchain too than to, I mean, also, it's actually easier to do this right on the foundation of blockchain than try to fix the existing compliance and voluntary markets, I think. Do you have something? Because I have something, but it might be a little far afield. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on, you mentioned it's easier to do that piece with the blockchain. I wanted to bring it back to other parts of blockchain technology that also will make it easier to do what Mm -hmm. we're trying to do. You know, we mentioned earlier on this podcast that you have the experience working with a bunch of farmers. And interestingly enough, we're also working with farmers now. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of gone full circle and are building better accounting methodologies into recording these physical assets into the digital assets as carbon removal credits. But what, what about the blockchain makes that whole piece easier that wasn't there before. 
it creates new opportunities to recognize both short-term and long-term carbon sequestration potential in land. And when we're talking carbon renewal, removal, sorry, the challenge for making this into a vibrant market has always been that there are some farm practices that we know will substantially increase the amount of carbon that's stored in the soils, remove that carbon from the atmosphere. We also know that it costs landowners a lot of money up front and for various reasons. When I was first looking at this, 50% of farmers who adopted the better practices were quitting between year three and five after initial adoption because it was just too hard. But if you can get them to year seven, they become more profitable farmers. So when we've got blockchain as the support. They don't even need to get paid for carbon sequestration. They're just making more money because the soils are more productive. Yeah. For many farmers, sort of by year seven, worst case scenario by year 12. So the question is, how do you get them through that tough stage? When you've got blockchain, it seems to me easier to introduce a commodity that some of which is tradable, some of which is held in reserve, that everybody can see that is potentially for the farmer an asset they can borrow against because it's there, it's theirs, it's apparent in a way that enables them to raise the financing they need to get through that tough time. And I'm skipping a bunch of details, but it's the transparency of the accounts in blockchain that creates opportunities for them to borrow against an asset that might not be tradable till they get to year seven, but is there is there in their name and is a real physical asset. Mm -hmm. My hope is that this becomes a lot easier to work through on the blockchain platform than in these other more complex and not transparent and ever-changing carbon markets. I don't know about you, Ross, but I don't think Alden's allowed to plead ignorance anymore when talking about blockchain. Seems like she knows what she's talking about. You know enough, at least to be dangerous at a cocktail party, and I think a lot more than you you let on sometimes. (laughs) And you're quite into soil. I know you've been writing a lot on the methodology of removing through soil. Again, there are many, many ways to achieve carbon renewal, renewal and adopting regenerative farming practices is not the only way. I just love being at the forefront of a space where the right thing to do for the environment is over time increasing profitability for food producers and food production. So that's why I love the soil story. It's certainly not the only story. No, but, but you're you're a businesswoman, so that's an easy sale, right? Yeah. You're just like, you're going to make money and do a good thing. Yeah. All we're trying to do is make getting through that really tough time easier. If we can get that right, which I'm confident we can, then it's going to make a huge difference. Yeah, sounds nice. I had a question that goes back to the derivatives market. Alden, do you think that if there were a derivatives market for nori ton, that it should settle in a nori ton or should it be in a, like a Bitcoin or something else? Well, of course, I'd like it to settle in nori ton because I think nori ton is a sustainable long-term currency. Is that the reason why some transactions are cash settled, like the, the Bitcoin yeah. derivatives market is cash settled? Again, this might be betraying my ignorance. I'm not saying I'm pessimistic about Bitcoin, but I'm much more likely to be confident that those cryptocurrencies out there that are, again, utilities attached to a fundamental deliverable are going to survive. And there's other cryptocurrencies that don't meet that test that might survive, but I'm less confident. I'm pretty confident that if we proceed with the Nori Ton design concepts that we've talked about to date, we're going to be creating one of those cryptocurrencies that is surviving. I think the, the worry, though, is that if it settles in Nori Ton, that means that like there's a level of insulation if it settles in a different currency rather than the underlying commodity. Uh, like If you shorted the like a huge short in the Nori Ton market, settles in Nori Ton could have a bigger effect than if it was in Bitcoin. You right? know, you're right. But guess what? what? The decision about how they're going to settle is up to the buyers, not us anyway. So I'm just maybe exposing like I shouldn't, maybe how I would play it. You know know what the good news is? What's that? Nothing we do is going to dictate how the market participants 
yeah, this is all sort of a little bit navel gazy and just sort of curious yeah. about yeah. theoretically how might this work. But yeah, okay, I'll kick it, kick it back over to you then. Final question, Alden. You know, the name of this podcast is the Reversing Climate Change Podcast, and that's what mm-hmm. we're talking about. So you are queen of the world <laughs> and have world domination yeah. to reverse climate change. How does it happen? If I was queen of the world, uh huh, I would have one worldwide rule, which is if you sell energy or building. Now I would be a dictator. Okay, fair. I, I wouldn't, you know, I, which is. Nori stands for the exact opposite of this, but you just made me queen of the world, so I'm going to be a dictator. Worldwide, everybody who sells what I call energy and building products would convert their sales into million BTU or gigajoule, depending on what country are equivalents, and they would report their global fossil carbon content per GD delivered to the world market, and they would be obliged to reduce it at a rate of 3% per annum and have the option of buying carbon removal credits as a compliance option so they can reduce in their supply chain and or buy carbon removal credits. And I wouldn't put any other compliance options on the table. (laughs) That sounds sounds good. Yeah, I I, I agree there. Let's let's do it. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Alden. Looking forward to taking these ideas and moving them forward in our marketplace. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.